So welcome everybody again to the Picture Language Seminar on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. We have several interesting upcoming talks. Next week, Sebastian Palku will speak and might be related to this talk. Then Leanne Kong, Sergei Gukov, Kwon Hong Shu, Yasuzuki Kawashigashi, and Shogun Wen. And today we're very pleased to have Joost Lingerland. He's speaking to us from Maynooth, the National University of Ireland, and will tell us about exploring small fusion categories, small fusion rings and tensor categories. Joost. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, and thanks very much for inviting me to give a seminar here. Uh, it looks like it's a really interesting uh, seminar. I think some of the earlier talks. And sorry, I didn't see it before. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm delighted uh, to be invited to Harvard, even if only uh, virtually, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> hopefully, it won't be the last time. Um, okay, so I'll share my screen and I'll start the talk. Um, so, um, yeah, I want to talk. Oh, dear, give me a minute. I'll find it. I'll find it. Um, oh, there we are. Yes, everybody can. See this, I shall just make it full screen now. This should work for everyone, I hope. Um, okay, so exploring small fusion rings and tensor categories. Uh, so this is work that I'm doing uh, at the moment in collaboration uh, with my student Gert Verkleijen. Um, and, uh, uh, but actually it's part of a project that, uh, it was a big project for me around 2006, 2007. Uh, and then it became dormant for a very long time. Um, and only some people kind of knew that I had these tools lying around. And so I, I thought we should make this public now and, uh, and try and make it useful for other people. Um, right, so let me just uh, dive into this. Uh, first of all, this is Manus. It's rather nice. If you can ever travel again, you should visit me. Um, and uh, I have a nice group of people working there with me. Um, uh, Gert is... Uh, the obvious one to mention, that's the one uh, who's done most of the programming uh, recently on this project, uh, although I've done a little bit. And uh, many of you may know Alex as well, uh, Polyband, who has recently joined us. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other people uh, that are also working on anion related stuff, uh, both in the ANE and on the postdoc, and Aaron is a student, and um, Sarah is still here as well, and there's a bunch of alumni. Okay, anyway, uh, so now uh, just to show you the history, this was from a talk in September 2007, which was, I think, the last talk I actually gave on the subject. And then uh, uh, that was around the time I moved to Ireland uh, and uh, got involved with, I, I think, four or five new collaborations at the same time on all different subjects, and I got completely distracted. Uh, but it's important to mention that at the time, um, this was definitely a project that was mostly in collaboration with Carson Olmerson, uh, but I've also been talking uh, with Teng Hong Wang and uh, his student at the time, Tobias, and Alexei Kitaev. And now I should particularly thank uh, Frank Verstraten because uh, he got Gert interested in working on this stuff. Uh, and he was, his, he was Frank's student for the first year and then uh, moved over to me. Um, and you can see yep. that the talk is... Uh, yes. There's a bit of feedback, uh, audio feedback. I don't know if it's coming from you. I have, I'm using headphones, uh, so I should not be generating feedback. I can turn my sound further down. I shouldn't be doing anything here. So probably check if everyone can check if they have their, uh, themselves muted. Is it still generating feedback? No, it's off now. It's better. Okay. It could be that it's the connection. It's been a bit iffy today, so sometimes you can get some distortion. Um, I hope it won't interfere with the rest of the talk. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, so I should mention Frank Verstraten. And um, obviously, uh, you can see in this talk that at the time, this was mostly work that was in preparation. So we had lots of results, but we actually then uh, left that in preparation for another 13 years or something. Uh, and it, uh, what I'm showing you today is also mostly in preparation, but now I have a very high level of confidence that a large percentage of it, anyway, is going to be uh, published very soon. Um, okay, so uh, this is the overview from the old talk. It's still somewhat appropriate, and I won't spend too much time on it. 
Um, so uh, fusion models and annual models are interesting abstractions of um, you know systems with topological excitations in physics. And um, so um, what we're interested in doing is finding different sets of fusion rules, uh, looking at the audience. I probably don't really have to explain what fusion rules are and what are categories and things like that. Um, and then uh, once we have these fusion rules, then we'll try and solve the pentagon and hexagon equations. Uh, so I will actually not look at the pentagon and the hexagon in this talk at all, but we do have tools, uh, old ones from, from the old days, to, to solve that as well. Um, and then uh, the whole states that I'm not going to really say anything about in this talk. Um, and there, there are obviously many goals uh, uh, to algebraically solve specific ANIA models, uh, to make a catalog of the simplest ANIA models, um, and uh, you would be able to look up all the fusion rules for a low rank and um, find various constants that are associated with the, any TTFTs you might have, etc. design. Um, this, Things that are useful for building local models in physics. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but we can actually do better now than what we thought at the time. So uh, we actually have built, uh, we're in the process of building a wiki um, where you can go and look up various data without any, doing any work uh, and you can contribute uh, to pages there. Uh, and we also have a Mathematica package in development and a lot of the tools are coming, all of this pulling slides are coming directly out of this package. Um, so I'll, sh I'll introduce both to you just briefly. So um, Daniel Wiki uh, is located at uh, this address here. And it is basically at the moment pretty much empty, except for this very important page, the list of small multiplicity free fusion rings. Um, <clears throat> so um, basically there we have a list of all multiplicity free fusion rings up to uh, uh, rank six. So uh, multiplicity free meaning that not the maximum multiplicity is one, of course, uh, and uh, with a bunch of data. So here's a, a sample, but I can actually show you the actual wiki live, and then uh, that, that could be interesting to have a brief view of that. Give me a minute. Um, let's share the screen. Um, so here's the new share. Actual wiki, if I can find it. Here, there is an important screen and we share. And it's going to show me the screen. Oh, no, wait, there it is. So this is um, actually live. So you can see if I click here, go back to the home page, go back to my list. And this list is quite interesting now because you can see that, uh, okay, first of all, um, we have the names of the rings. And uh, we were having some trouble with standardized, uh, names are not really standardized. It's hard to, um, if you find something new, where does it fit in? So we came up with the naming scheme. I'm not going to really go into that now, but if you ever find a new fusion ring, it will fit into our naming scheme. Uh, and you can find it explained on the wiki. Um, but more interestingly, you can see that uh, this is a table with a bunch of um, properties. Obviously, the rank, the number of particles, the number of self dual particles, the number of non-zero structure constants in the in the ring, the um, uh, total, the square of the total quantum dimension, um, whether it's commutative, whether it's a group, whether it's can be categorified to a fusion category or a graded fusion category, category or a modular fusion category, and whether it can be categorified to a unitary fusion category. Um, now, and of course, the nice thing is you can sort all these things. So, for example, I can decide um, at this point it's actually sorted on uh, uh, increasing uh, total quantum dimension, uh, but then I can decide instead to sort it uh, on the rank. And then afterwards, on, on increasing total quantum dimensions. So if I click rank now, then I'll have it sorted in that order. Um, so I see that the, obviously I get the trivial theory first, and then the, um, the two theories of rank two uh, sorted by total quantum dimension, and then the, two, the, uh, the theories of rank three. But I could have decided instead to uh, sort by this first, um, uh, and then by 
by rank and then by the number of self dual particles. So then let's see, for example, that now uh, the rank four theories um, are um, actually, uh, I, I, get, <laughs> I get the theories with the fewest number of self dual particles first. And anyway, so just playing around with this is quite interesting. And also, the, just looking up things, you can actually um, go all the way down here to. Uh, we have the, 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 the table at the moment completely filled in for all the theories up to the rank five. Let me sort by rank so you can see that. Um, you can also sort so that all the modular theories come first after the rank, so that you can not worry about uh, non modular theories if you want to, or just look only at the non modular theories. Um, and you can also click on every one of the rings and uh, immediately be sent, for example, to the Future rules for that ring. This is a particularly boring one, um, but uh, slightly more interesting would be, for example, this one. Um, and then it also tells you the quantum dimensions uh, of the individual particles. Uh, and we plan to add a lot more information uh, here, like, for example, we also introduce uh, the Fabian Schur indicators, and we will have, we plan to have links to all the categorifications uh, for the smaller rings as well. Okay, so this. Just an advert, and you can see that there are many very uh, simple pages that should probably be filled in. But we have basically not focused on the theories so far. But if you're interested in writing a page about the Pentacle equation, then uh, we can probably make it an account for you. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my talk, um, and uh, I'm not sure I don't skip anything. the Anion wiki uh, plug. Um, right, so um, yes, fusion rules and fusion algebras. So basically, um, we're going to be at the lowest level of sophistication here. And this day, we have a set of fusion rules. We have objects labeled A, B, C, etc. A times B fused to some uh, number of times C. And we call these multiplicities here uh, and A, B, C. And they're supposed to be positive, uh, well, non negative integers. And then um, uh, we will actually allow multiplicities greater than one in this talk. Um, and um, of course, we, we have some requirements. So there should be a, a vacuum uh, particle that fuses trivially with everything, and also uh, duality, so that um, uh, if, for every particle, of every, uh, for every object, we have an anti object that can fuse with to the uh, identity. And we require uh, so far, although we don't really have to, but it makes our life a lot easier, that the left and right jewels are the same, left and right antiparticles. Um, and we also uh, require this set of pivotal relations here uh, that you can, if you have fusion of A, B, and C, uh, the, um, the multiplicity for that should be the same as fusing, for example, A jewel with C to B. Uh, so you can think of it as you bend this A down, and then you have uh, a dual and C coming together to B. And so that vertex should have the same multiplicity. Um, so requiring this makes our life a lot easier or a lot nicer because, for example, it means that all the fusion matrices are normal. But also physically, it's hard to imagine theories where um, this would not be satisfied. So especially if the left and right dual are already the same. Um, of course, the most important constraint is that the fusion is associative. Um, so if we fuse A and B, the C with C, A and B and C, then A and B together or B and C together first uh, doesn't matter for the final result. And that's this equation for the uh, multiplicity then. And so now we can say, well, let's find all these fusion rings. Uh, and the simplest thing you can do is just do a, a stupid brute force search. Uh, so you say we have uh, big C types of charges. So uh, that's the, the rank, right? Uh, and then, um, if we have multiplicity two, then uh, each of the uh, each of the coefficients could be zero or one in principle. Um, so we have a choice of two for each coefficient. We have, uh, in principle, uh, the number of particles to the third different coefficients, uh, and so you get then two to the power c to the power three. Um, or if we want higher multiplicities, then uh, if m is the highest allowed multiplicity, then it would be m to the power c to the power 3. Um, so um, this is not good. Like This is 
failing is really terrible. So I actually, of course, did this at the very start of the project and find that I could only get up to about five particles um, uh, with this uh, uh, with this strategy. Uh, so that wasn't very useful, but anyway, it was a good start. So then the next thing is, what can you do to make to be smarter about this? Um, so, um, well, uh, Gebner and Kapustin wrote a paper in 1995 where they tried to list all the potentially modular uh, tensor categories, and uh, you can adapt their strategy to also search for uh, for fusion rings. And basically, the idea is, um, if you think of the, if you look at the fusion algebra, then um, it will have one-dimensional representations if it's abelian anyway. Um, so this, this strategy will only really work if the theories are abelian, or at least if they're non-abelian, it's more complicated. Um, anyway, so you send each object to a number, uh, complex number, and then these numbers themselves satisfy the fusion rules now. Um, uh, and then you can see that, um, okay, uh, the, if you look at these numbers labeled, uh, uh, at the vectors of these numbers, they're actually the eigenvectors of the fusion matrices. Easy to, to see. And uh, so, um, so you can basically uh, say, okay, well, uh, we can use that now uh, to reduce the search space for the fusion rules. Because if we fill in one fusion matrix instead of all the fusion matrix matrices, so we say uh, for each particle we have n, you know, c squared coefficients for its fusion matrix, uh, telling telling me that if I a Use A with B, I get a certain number of times C, then B and C are the coefficients of the, of the matrix. And the, and the number of times, of course, is the, the entry. Anyway, these matrices, they're all simultaneously diagonalizable if the theory is abelian. And then I can uh, find their eigenvalues and their eigenvectors, more importantly. And once I know the eigenvectors, I, and then, um, of course, that's the same information as having all the fusion matrices. So, what I can do is I can fill in only one fusion matrix, uh, find these eigenvectors, and hopefully there are enough uh, there there are enough unique ones that uh, uh, that I can reconstruct all the other fusion matrices. And this is a slightly better uh, strategy, um, and I was able to get up to almost in some cases with seven particles with this, uh, but it's also a lot more complicated. Um, uh, to implement properly, and it uh, restricts you kind of to, um, let's say, it, uh, to abelian uh, categories. So the main reason I have this slide here still is because I think for some for some purposes this could still be a good strategy to search. For example, you might be interested in fusion categories, particularly that are completely generated by one of the fusion matrices. So there's a, there's a generating particle in them. Then you might want to search in this way. But actually, we came up with a better idea, uh, which brought us a lot further. And it's kind of um, less cute because it doesn't really use the, the mathematics of fusion uh, algebras uh, or fusion rules. But it turns out to be much faster and, and much more flexible. So I'm going to try and explain that now. All right. So the first thing to do is you, you still want to just pick these fusion coefficients. Um, but the first thing you want to do is you want to break the symmetry of the problem. You know, there's a big symmetry because I can just reorder the particles in any order. So once I have eight particles and you know, eight factorial different orders, and they would in principle all be different fusion rings. Of course, the first thing I do is to choose that the first particle is always the identity particle, okay, the, the vacuum. Uh, and then I can say, okay, well, let's also choose it so that uh, all the self-dual particles that exist in the theory are first, and then all the non self dual particles, they're always in pairs. And so we have a bunch of uh, self dual particles first and then pairs of, uh, of dual particles. Um, but you can actually do more because you can also say, for example, well, we, um, uh, after that, we want to order the particles by the number of non zero uh, fusion coefficients or the total, the, by the total of the fusion coefficients in their fusion matrices. Um, so we can add that as a requirement on our uh, solution. So we just say, um, for any uh, value of these fusion coefficients, so here we have the fusion matrix N i with uh, B and C then uh, as the coefficients, we require that um, if this is for particle i and we sum over B and C, that's going to be less than 
or equal to what we get for particle i plus one, and we require that for every particle. So we order them this way. Um, Excuse me, uh, yeah. Yost, if you maximized your picture, you might it might be easier to see at this end. Oh, yes, sorry, I forgot to maximize. Can I do that? Uh, I should have done this straight away. Sorry about that. Is this, is this better? Much better. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, so basically, uh, we can get some mileage out of ordering the coefficients. We also get some mileage already out of the pivotal uh, relations that I uh, showed for earlier. Um, but then afterwards, uh, the strategy becomes really simple and really general. And what we basically do is we say, OK, now we have a bunch of constraints. Uh, the most important ones being associativity, of course, so those are these equations. But then in addition, these ordering constraints um, and whatever other constraints we might like. So we might want to have some look for some special types of theory, um, but we haven't done that at the moment. Um, and then we say, OK, um, let's find the constraint, which has the smallest number of variables appearing in it. Um, we call the set of variables that appear in that constraint v1. So we suppose it's maybe three variables, so however many appear there. There may be multiple uh, equations with the same, or constraints with the same number. It doesn't matter. We choose one. OK, now we find all the constraints that depend only on the variables that appear in that one. Uh, and we call that set of equations or that set of constraints uh, C1. OK, fine. So, and then we just iterate that. So we assume that all the variables in the first set of uh, variables are actually known. Uh, and then uh, we look at all the, so we look at all the uh, equations again, all the constraints, and we find the one that now has the smallest number of unknowns. Um, and we say, okay, well, um, that's a new set of unknowns. Let's call that uh, V2. And we find all the equations again that are completely fixed once you set uh, the variables in, in, the, in the second set. And then you keep this going um, until you've exhausted all the variables. So then you have a whole set, V1, V2, V3, etc., which are variables that are belonging together uh, and the equations that you, uh, uh, that you can actually evaluate once you know the values of those variables, of those groups of variables. And then after that, you do an incredibly simple backtracking algorithm. So you basically say, OK, look, um, you know, uh, First, we fill in the first set of variables. Uh, so here, v11 is the first variable in the first set. We set it equal to one of the uh, numbers 0 to m, where m is our maximally allowed multiplicity. Do the same with the second variable in that set, uh, all the way down to the last variable. OK, so now we can evaluate the first equations. We, can, we see uh, if they're verified. If they're not verified, we already know we don't have to look at any of the other variables because we already violated the first equation. So then we try a new, um, uh, th th then we basically try a new set of values for these uh, for these variables. Uh, so we run through all the possible variables this way. Uh, and whenever a set of variables works, then uh, we go on and fill in the second set of variables, V2. Uh, and uh, again, if it doesn't work, then uh, the tree cuts off at the second level and go back to scratch. But if it does work, then we go to the third level of the tree. And so basically, we get this enormous set of nested for loops. Uh, that we have a mathematical code that writes C code that makes a whole bunch of for loops in this way. Uh, and then we just run it in C. Um, and so we might have 40 something or 100 nested for loops. Um, and this turns out to be incredibly efficient. Uh, so I would have never thought that this would have worked so well, but it's just, it's amazing. Um, so we were actually able to go to, um, we found all the multiplicity free theories with nine particles, and I'll show you the results in a minute. Um, so the ni nice thing about this is we don't need to fill out an entire matrix um, of variables, uh, or let alone all the variables. Uh, so we, uh, we usually manage to stop checking already uh, well before we reach deep into the tree. Um, and uh, also, this will work much better with any extra constraints that you want to put on the coefficients. Just extra constraints makes it easier. Um, all right, so that's uh, our simple strategy to find true series. OK, now, next thing is we, uh, we take all of our information and we, stop it in, we stick it in a Mathematica code. Um, so 
so we can actually do something with fusion rings. So just a quick introduction. Uh, you go into Mathematica, say import fusion rings. Um, then um, it, one of the things that it imports automatically is this fusion ring list, which is just a list of all our saved fusion ring objects. And then I can say, for example, okay, fusion ring, the third element in fusion ring list, let's call that fib ring. It's not a coincidence because that's the fusion ring, it's actually the Fibonacci ring. Then we can say, oh, let's make a symbolic multiplication table. There it is. Um, the two part is non trivial one, two times two is one plus two, Fibonacci fusion rule, everything works great. You can also have the individual diffusion matrices for the identity here and the Fibonacci particle here. And the quantum dimensions, one and the um, uh, golden ratio here. Obviously, we only get the Frobenius Perron quantum dimensions here because we don't have any of the um, structure of the, of the category, only the rings. Oh, sorry. Um, we can calculate the number of non-zero structure constants. We can also do some more interesting stuff like, for example, okay, first of all, here are the first nine rings in the table. Um, right? So um, with with their names that we, uh, we can add more names if you want to. The names don't really mean anything. But you see the last one here is SU2 is level three, the ninth uh, one in our list, which we also know happens to be Fibonacci times uh, Z2. Then uh, we can apply with decompositions and it says, oh, that's actually if you, uh, Z2 times uh, Fibonacci. Uh, so it, it, it finds it from the actual uh, internal data, not from the list of names. Um, but we can also ask for the subset, the subfusion rings, and it says, oh, particles one and two actually form a Z2 fusion ring. Particles one and four form a Fibonacci fusion subfusion ring. So these are very simple things, but once you have a lot of fusion rules, it becomes quite nice to be able to apply this kind of stuff in bulk. Um, so now let's look at how many fusion rules we have. We have at the moment, oh, when I made this uh, this slide, we had 28,451 uh, fusion rules in our database. Um, and then uh, you can, of course, separate them also by, uh, by rank. Uh, so there's a unique one of rank one. Um, and we had 17 of rank two, 161 of rank three, over 2,000 of rank four, 16,000 of rank five, and then they go down again. Basically, that's because, well, we didn't go, uh, we can't go to as high multiplicity as a high rank, so then we end up with fewer rings. So that's why to make clear what happens, um, I made a table here um, by both the rank and multiplicity. So if you look at the, um, the rank is uh, in the vertical direction. Uh, so you see there's a unique uh, ring of rank one, which also has multiplicity one, it's a trivial ring, uh, and there are no higher multiplicity versions, so that's why you have a, a line of zeros here. And for rank two, it's also easy to what see to understand, to understand what happens. So at uh, fit multiplicity three, we have the Z2 ring and the Fibonacci ring, and then all the higher ones here are just these rings here, uh, with a non-trivial particle going psi times psi is one plus n times psi. And of course we know that none of these are actually categories uh, for n greater than one, uh, but, uh, but they're perfectly good rings, so they, they're there. That's why we have this line of ones. Okay, then uh, for rank four, it's already increasing with the multiplicity, and then uh, it just goes completely crazy. And you can see that, uh, so for four, five, for rank, one, two, three, four, and five, we just went up to uh, multiplicity 16. And then for rank six, we, have, uh, we haven't uh, gone beyond multiplicity eight yet because it started to become more difficult, although we could definitely go higher uh, with a bit of effort. For rank seven, we've gone up to multiplicity four, rank eight, multiplicity two, and rank nine, uh, we haven't got beyond um, multiplicity three theories yet, but I think we could. Um, Rank 10 is going to be pushing it. We might be able to do the um, some of the rank 10, some subsets of rank 10. And to talk about the subsets, I'm going to go to the next slide now. I'll make some superficial observations of what happens there. So um, it makes sense also to uh, separate the um, the rings by uh, the number of non-self-dual particles. So here we have a table that's just like the one I showed you before, except I'm only showing you the uh, numbers of theories that 
where all the particles are self dual. Um, so uh, then here's a similar table, um, but uh, all the theories in this table have two non self dual particles. Um, so basically splitting the previous table by uh, how many particles are non self dual. So clearly you can't have two non self dual particles if you only have one or two particles. Um, so that starts from rank three. And then you see the unique rank three theory. Uh, there are no higher multiplicity ones uh, with two non self dual particles, and that's just set pre fusion rules. And actually, it's very easy to prove without a computer. <laughs> uh, but for rank four, there's something interesting. You see that now the numbers are sort of fluctuating four, two, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, and there's a number four. And, um, and if you look into that a bit, then you see, okay, look, um, actually, there are three variables left, and three variables there really um, that satisfy a single equation. The, these um, the fusion coefficients, m223, m233, and m333. Um, but of course, this equation is, uh, these things are integers, so this equation is not completely trivial to solve. And you can, you can understand it well enough to feel like you know what's going on, but it doesn't necessarily make it easy to immediately predict how many or to immediately say how many uh, even rank four theories there are with two non self dual particles at a given multiplicity and so the horizontal direction here is multiplicity um, so it's kind of interesting uh, and then you see that above above here begins to grow uh, again for five six seven eight and nine particles now if we say there's four uh, particles that are not self dual so two pairs of dual particles then we see um, what well, rank five. Of course, we have set modulo five. And now you might think that it would be like set three, that would be the only thing. But actually, there's a multiplicity two theory there um, for non self dual particles. And that turns out to be uh, the representation ring of the smallest odd order non abelian group. Uh, so the dimensions of the particles are one, 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 three, and three. It's a group of order 21, uh, semi direct orders of the set three with set seven. Um, and uh, above that, it gets complicated again. I'm just looking at the boundary cases here. And if you do the same thing with um, six non self dual particles, then you see that there's a situation here with rank seven. Uh, of course, the first theory with multiplicity three is just set modulo seven. But then at multiplicity two, there's two theories now. And they both have dimensions one, 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 and four threes. Uh, and uh, so, that suggests that there might be the representation category of a group, uh, or the representation, yeah, of a group of order 39, uh, you know, four times three squared plus three times one squared. But there is only one monobelian group of uh, order 39. So one of them is, is it, but the other one is something different. We don't know if there's a category. It would be kind of interesting if there was one. Um, and that last one here, um, the one, or the, the unique one with multiplicity three there, um, is actually also uh, a, a group of, uh, with dimensions, um, with two five dimensional representations here. Okay, and then of course uh, the last case is where we have eight uh, uh, non self dual particles, but you can only do one case there, which is the non multiplicity free Z uh, nine particle case, and uh, that's the two non abelian group, the two abelian groups there, Z nine and Z three times Z three. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an idea how it splits out. Of course, you can ask much more interesting questions, but it gives an idea of what we're looking at here. Um, so the million dollar question here, of course, which of our rings corresponds to fusion categories or even complete annual models or, you know, uh, unitary graded tensor categories or topological field theories. Um, so, um, so actually, the questions about the, uh, the more richer structures are, of course, easier to answer in the negative uh, than, than the question about fusion categories. Uh, so now I have some fusion category basics. I probably don't have to say much. The basic idea is that now, um, uh, instead of having only a ring, you have actual vector spaces uh, for uh, fusing the uh, for every for every uh, fusion of particles A and B, and you get states. Uh, or three particles A, B, and C with a basis, um, two different bases, depending on how you fuse them, which order, and then you have uh, these F matrix, these F symbols here, 
um, that are um, that are codifying the associativity now at the level of states. So we're getting closer to uh, describing a quantum mechanical system where we think about right, cat states for um, for fusion and, uh, and and for splitting. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we have these basis transformations with the F matrices um, that, uh, that that bring you from one basis to the other. And uh, then, of course, I, I'm, I'm kind of assuming everybody here knows this, so I guess I'm going very fast through this. Uh, but if you, if you don't, you should definitely uh, stop me. Uh, then you have a tentacle equation, which is basically a consistency equation for combining uh, local F moves on diagrams. Right? So uh, I can go from this four particle state here um, and I express it in this other uh, basis here, um, where the particles fuse in a different order. I can go from here to here in two different ways using either two F moves or three F moves at the bottom. These form a pentagon. And then you can write uh, an equation that the F uh, symbols, the, the coefficients of this uh, basis transformation, uh, have to satisfy in order for these two ways of going uh, to actually give you the same thing. Um, and now the interesting thing, of course, is that these pentacon equations, um, they're actually quite restrictive. They're far more equations than there are variables for a start. Um, and so you could try and solve these directly just to find the, the, the possible uh, structure constants. And if you know the, so the F symbols, and if you know the F symbols completely, then you know the whole category. And because it's just the data that determines the category if you choose a basis. Okay. Um, so here I've left off the vertex labels. In principle, this uh, equation is only good for um, for the case where you have no multiplicity greater than one, but it's easy to put them back in. It just makes it messy. Um, okay. And we have a solver now that's in principle completely algorithmic uh, for the multiplicity-free case. Although the scaling is really terrible, but you can you can solve many interesting theories uh, even with eight particles, for example. Um, we're working or towards a solver with multiplicities, but that's definitely a, a slightly bigger project still. Um, might take a while. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, how do we solve the pentagon equations. I'm not going to actually spend too much time on it because I'm going to say some other things um, that don't require the pentagon equations. So first of all, uh, the pentagon equations are third order, order polynomial equations, and there are many variables. Uh, so you can see the third order because I need to have three F symbols on the right hand side here with the summation, and two F symbols on the left hand side. So they're at most third order if the three F symbols on the side all happen to be the same variable. Right? Uh, crucially, usually they're not all the same variable. So very often the equations are actually only linear uh, in each of the variables that occur here, or in, in at least in some of the variables. Uh, but there will be some that are third order. Okay, um, so there are many more equations than there are variables, um, just because you have more ways of choosing fusions of four objects than fusions of three objects. Um, and there's a gauge freedom, which I will show on the next slide, uh, which gives you parameter families of the equivalent solutions if you have solutions. There aren't always solutions, of course. Um, okay, now. Then there's Kotniano rigidity, which basically tells you that once you manage to fix the gauge freedom, take out the gauge freedom, and then there's only a discrete set of solutions. And um, actually, once you fix the gauge freedom, then it's clear that you can, in principle, solve the equations algorithmically using Gerbner basis, because Gerbner basis are a method for solving uh, arbitrary polynomial equations. Uh, which is algorithmic if you know that the solute, that there are only finitely many solutions. Um, now, that sounds great, but uh, Gerdner basis methods scale really badly, uh, worse than exponential in both the number of variables, the number of equations, and the degree of the equations. Everything is terrible. So it really only works in practice if you can somehow manage to dramatically simplify um, well, reduce the number of variables and, if possible, simplify the equations. Uh, but that turned out to be actually quite possible most of the time, um, precisely because a lot of the time the equations are linear in at least uh, one variable. Um, 
And so then you can eliminate that variable straight away and substitute back. Um, and uh, of course, you have to be a bit smart about this. So typically, you want to choose equations with uh, which are which don't have uh, sum over sums in them first um, to, to make this work well. But uh, but the, the the simplification step is quite conceptually easy, and uh, and then after that, you can apply Grobner basis. You can easily go back in the simplification step from several hundred variables to only three variables, and then you apply your uh, Grodner basis algorithm. So the main thing is that um, you do have to fix the gauge, um, but um, for multiplicity-free theories, we already had this implemented uh, in 2005 or 6, and also the actual uh, solutions afterwards. There's only one issue, which is that some of your estimates may be zero, and then the gauge fixing doesn't work. So let me show how the gauge fixing actually works. So um, the gauge freedom works like this. You have an F symbol. Uh, I've left off the uh, weak indices for the multiplicity, so this is a multiplicity free case. And then for each um, vertex which appears in the uh, F move, uh, you get a, a, a gauge factor. So these U's are just complex numbers, or if it's a unitary theory, then you can make them uh, complex numbers of unit norm, unitary one by one matrices, if you like. Um, and so, uh, if I change the basis in each of the vertex spaces uh, by, by this factor of u, so u a b for the a b vertex, um, then the f symbols change in this way by this ratio of four of these vertex factors. And if you have r symbols, then you change in this way. And now it's a very simple basic idea. So you can um, set an f symbol uh, equal to some constant, whichever you want, uh, but not equal to zero by choosing one of the u's. So, you know, for example, here you could choose u of a, b, e to be equal to all of the rest of the right-hand side. Uh, and then the, the transformed f symbol will just be equal to 1. Um, right. So, I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious. So, um, and then you say, well, th then we know that u, so we just resubstitute that into all of the other equations. And the nice thing is that all the equations remain of the same kind of form. So they're always some uh, big product of uh, u's and inverse u's and f's and inverse f's. Um, and I can keep doing the same trick until I eliminate all the uh, all the gauge factors. Um, the only problem is some of the f symbols may be zero, and then you end up dividing by zero. Uh, and uh, obviously, that wouldn't be good. Um, so you have to figure out first, before you start gauge fixing, which of the f symbols are actually zero. Um, so if you can do that, then you have an algorithmic way of solving at least multiplicity-free um, um, theories. Okay, so uh, this is a small demonstration I put in the Tambar Tambari Amagami theories here, but I think if we want have time to show this, I will skip over it, and then if you want to see it later, I'll bring it back. Um, right, so you have to find out which of the S symbols are zero. Um, and um, we didn't, we, we at, at the time in 2005 6, we were using a trick, basically assuming that the theory is unitary. Um, we get some extra equations, like, for example, this equation here says that uh, if I sum over a particular uh, row of the matrix, uh, the absolute values of the F symbols in that row, uh, then of course they have to add up to one. Uh, absolute value squared have to add up to one because that's precisely what it means for the matrix to be unitary, and the same for the columns. And there's some other equations that are known for unitary theories. And, um, and we can also use all the homogeneous equations in this way if, if we don't have any sums in the product of three Fs, uh, which happens for a lot of the pentagon equations, um, then uh, we can just take absolute squared like this. And so we end up with a set of equations for the absolute squared value um, of, uh, of all the F symbols. And then we can try uh, to find them. And of course, we will find out which ones are zero. And for the other ones, we'll find the absolute values. And then we can, in the fixing procedure, we, when we set the, um, the s to particular constants, we set them equal to their own absolute value. Um, and that's great, because if we do that, um, the resulting gauge has the property that if the f matrices, matrices can be unitary, they will be automatically unitary. And if they can be real, they will be automatically real. 
Um, so you don't have to worry about afterwards trying to gauge them into the unitary or real form. It will automatically happen if you choose uh, to gauge a priori in this way. The only problem is the this trick doesn't always work because you don't always have enough equations to fix the absolute value of the F symbols. But in the meantime, we have actually uh, implemented uh, code now to um, basically always find out which F, a, a set of different uh, groups of F symbols which may be zero. Um, and uh, then you just try to solve the pentacom equations afterwards with each of the possible patterns of zeros. Uh, so this can be a bit slow, um, but it's anyway algorithmic. I could say more, but I think it's less interesting than what I would say uh, after this. So, so this problem has in principle been solved, although we still think that the author is kind of useful for um, when it can be used. It's actually makes everything nicer. Um, okay. Um, so, um, okay, now the solving the pentacom equations this way is, okay, you can do it, but it's a bit of a pain still. Uh, we need to automate this more. At the moment, it's in principle algorithmic, but we have to often intervene because we do things algebraically and Mathematica doesn't like to do certain things properly. And anyway, <laughs> it's a bit of a hassle. So, uh, we want to not waste our time on uh, uh, tensor cap or on fusion rings that are uh, going to be uninteresting. Uh, so we want to figure out which ones are interesting and which ones are definitely not interesting. Um, so, um, okay, so for example, if you want to see if a particular fusion ring can be the fusion ring of a modular tensor category, uh, then we say, well, a modular tensor category, we know it has, it must have a modular S matrix, which has the property that this matrix will simultaneously diagonalize the fusion matrices. Uh, it will be symmetric and unitary, and it squares the, the charge conjugation matrix, which is in every particle to its antiparticle. In particular, that also implies then that the fourth power of the S matrix is equal to one. Okay, there's also a diagonal T matrix. I'll just ignore that now, uh, but it's worth looking into more also. Um, so now it's actually really easy to check if such a matrix exists for any set of fusion rules because you just find the fusion characters, which you can do by just diagonalizing some random linear combination of the fusion matrices, and that will generically always give you all the fusion characters. Um, and then you just reorder and renormalize these fusion characters. I mean, they're the, the actual eigenvectors of all the matrices. So you already know that you can make a matrix out of those that will diagonalize all the matrices at the same time. The only question is if you can make a symmetric matrix uh, out of them. Um, so in order to do that, you uh, basically play around a bit with renormalizing the, um, the vectors um, and reordering them in all the possible orders. And this is a very simple process. I, I have about um, this much mathematical code that does that for me. Um, and then you see if one of the orders satisfies the requirements for this S matrix. Uh, so, so you always find the S matrix uh, of, of any modular tensor category this way if it exists. Um, so now, similarly, you can look at uh, non modular cat tensor categories, but which are graded. Um, so, we know that they must have a symmetric subcategory, uh, the so called transparent object, which grades trivially with everything. It must be a non trivial uh, subcategory like that. Um, and we also know that uh, symmetric categories uh, uh, are representation categories of finite groups. Uh, we talked about here Robert's theorem. Um, so we can quite easily identify the absence of such subrings. Um, and then uh, we, we know that if, if a theory that doesn't have a subring like that uh, and is also not modular, then it's definitely also not graded. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I, I saw that there was some work recently by uh, Yu, Balku, and Wu, who are some of whom are probably here, <laughs> uh, about obstructions to tensor category structure, which uh, hopefully you will understand and also be able to implement. Um, okay, so um, right, so I basically uh, this weekend ran the uh, the check on whether there's an S matrix on our uh, database, and then you see uh, in this table here. Um, we just order all the tensor categories by um, the uh, multiplicity, first of all. So each of these veins here is multiplicity, so multiplicity three, most, uh, highest multiplicity two, highest multiplicity three, etc. And then 
the rank is rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five, etc. in the horizontal. And the uh, vertical splitting is how many uh, non self dual particles does the theory have? Right? So um, the top here means no, no, no uh, all particles are self dual, and the bottom is the maximum number of non self dual particles. Okay. Um, and then uh, you look at the, uh, at the table here, and you see there's some funny things happening. For example, if you look at the two at, at the rank two, uh, you see that the, it looks like all the uh, well, all the fusion rings are uh, potentially modular. And it's very easy to understand because basically, if you have a two by two uh, unitary matrix and you can renormalize uh, one of the elements and remove the, you can always make it symmetric uh, as well. So the check is completely trivial on, on two dimensional graphic, or, you know, on, on rank two. Uh, so that's a bit silly. And then similarly, if you look at uh, at all the other ranks, there are usually more categories than uh, than there should be. So you don't you find categories that are not modular, but most of the time it's completely trivial. Uh, for example, at rank four, you find all these extra categories here, but most of them just factorize into one of the uh, rank two categories that were wrong, um, uh, and then some other category. So it's kind of clear straight away that they're also not modular. Um, so, um, so if we just compare this um, to the uh, uh, to the known list of modular categories, then I can see that we have basically um, you know all the all the usual suspects. I've only checked up to uh, rank six so far, and uh, not and uh, not list three. So uh, we definitely didn't find anything new there that was. Uh, 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 that we think is modular and, and wasn't known. Uh, but I can't be completely sure yet about the higher uh, multiplicities. I'd, I'd be surprised if you find something. But anyway, but there is some interesting cases also um, where an S matrix uh, of the kind that was talking about exists, but there's no modular tensor category. Um, for example, um, here's uh, a theory that I already have in my notes from 2006 and 7. Um, this theory looks just like SU2 level 4. Um, We've seen there's a simple current here, and then um, there's five particles. And the only difference is that um, the particles of psi three and psi four, which are quantum dimension square root three, um, are um, they're not self-dual, but they're dual to each other. Um, oh wait, yeah, yeah, that's right. Because here psi zero is the um, is the identity, so psi zero appears here when I multiply. Psi four with psi three. Uh, so um, but it's interesting. But for example, the quantum dimensions uh, are the same as for SU2 level four. Um, and it turns out that this can be solved. So I could already solve this in 2006, probably. Um, there are two solutions of the Pentagon equation. They call a mirror pair, uh, basically, complex conjugation that relates them. Um, and uh, all the Reassuring papers kappa here are um, uh, are, true, are are equal to one for the self dual particles, um, but there is a perfectly good S matrix for this thing that looks just like it should be a modular uh, category. So should we should we have a name for these things? Is this something people have looked at before a lot? Uh, it seems like this might be interesting. This might be an interesting characteristic of a of a fusion ring. Um, I, I plotted. Uh, Two times square root three times the S matrix, the total quantum dimension times the S matrix here, just to make the numbers more recognizable. One, one, two, square root three, square root three, minus square root three here, um, and then minus square root three i here, because it's a complex number because it's not self dual, so it can't be the real matrix. Okay, so that's uh, one thing that we run into. Um, then we also found so far 118 non abelian fusion rings. Um, which I've split up in cells, same way as the um, uh, as the uh, pseudo modular ones from the previous slide. Oh. Um, so um, if you do this by multiplicity and rank, oh, come on, sorry people, it's annoying. Um, then you see that uh, you find the first ones at rank six. So this is rank six here going down by multiplicity. So um, at rank six, we we know that we have the first non-abelian group, uh, D3, uh, and the Hagrop, um, and those are both uh, uh, th 
those are both the ones that are multiplicity free, but there are also multiplicity two, three, four, etc. more theories. Um, but we also find things at rank seven, eight, and nine. These zeros you should not take seriously, it's just because we haven't looked um, at high enough multiplicity for those uh, ranks. You can also split them out again by how many non self dual particles there are. Um, so you see that. Um, this can only occur if, the, if there are non self dual particles. If they're self dual particles, our theories are automatically, only if they're purely self dual, they're automatically uh, commutative also. Okay, so uh, just a brief overview of the rank six non abelian fusion rings. Um, so uh, you have the smallest non abelian proof and the high group. Um, and then most of the other ones are trivial. Uh, Higher multiplicity versions of the high group where um, this side 2 plus side 3 plus side 4 here, the non group like elements, they appear with the high multiplicity 5 here, for example, uh, but it also appears with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it always appears. But there are four other ones um, that don't have a subgroup, so these all have subgroups at 3. Um, there's one particularly interesting one, um, which is actually. Uh, at uh, multiplicity two, and this is actually a Hecker algebra. Um, so uh, here we have a theory that has um, two particles that both uh, are Fibonacci particles and generate Fibonacci subrings. But then, if you take the product of those two, um, it depends which order you take to get different particles. If you take particle three times two or two times three, but then two times three times two and three times two times three are the same. This is the usual grading relation from the Hecker algebra. Um, and um, so for the, for the two generators of the Hecker algebra, uh, the grade generators. Um, and uh, you can easily see that there must be a, a multiplicity two there. It's the only multiplicity that appears. And I would be really curious to know if anyone has seen this uh, fusion category before uh, or knows if there is a corresponding fusion category, because otherwise we might spend some actual effort to try and prove that this thing corresponds to the category or not, obviously. Um, all right, then rank seven, non being fusion rings, I'm going to go really fast, but basically um, here are the quantum dimensions of all 20 rings that we found. Um, uh, and uh, you can see that they take some interesting, there's some interesting numbers here. Um, there's a lot of them have six ones here, that means that they're just basically Tambari, Yamagami-like uh, theories, or uh, how to say it, um, Tambari, Yamagami-like fusion uh, rings from D3, and we know that none of those uh, are actually categories, or at least not uh, the Mario Amagami itself. But there's some interesting other ones. Um, at rank 8, we have a very nice class of fusion rings, which I wanted to say something about. Um, so, uh, which basically, it turns out that all the, all the non-linear rings for, um, except for 4 at rank 6 that we found, all of them uh, have some subgroup in the fusion uh, in the fusion ring, um, and um, so it's interesting to tr think about building non-abelian fusion rings from groups. And it turns out if you take the finite group G, which you can take it to be non-abelian, it works also if it's abelian, but then it's not so interesting. And you take a normal subgroup H of this group, and then you take simple objects labeled by the elements of of the uh, big group. Um, then um, you can add to that uh, a single object of further objects labeled by the cosets. So, for example, if you take the big group to be the Z3, the, uh, the six element non abelian group, uh, then you take the normal subgroup to be Z3, and you have two cosets. So then you have eight particles total. Um, uh, and then, uh, in addition, we have a non trivial element of the uh, a non trivial coset element of G mod H, so Z of Z2, so two choices here. Um, and also we have an automorphism of the quotient group. Uh, and once we have chosen all of those, and the automorphism and the special element have to satisfy these two equations. Um, but it's very easy to satisfy these. For example, if I take the element G0 to be trivial, uh, then the first equation is already satisfied. And the second equation then says that the automorphism has the property that it's in, it's its own inverse. So, for example, I can take the trivial automorphism or the 
automorphism, which sends all the elements to their inverses, um, uh, which is perfectly good if uh, G mod H is an abelian group. Okay, and then we just define the fusion like this. So this looks very similar to Tambari and Magami, um, but it has the nice feature that sometimes there actually is a, a, a fusion category with actual S symbols. Um, uh, I can bring that back if people want to see it again later. Um, right, and then it turns out that, of course, I wanted to know if some of these existed, and I had, I, I was working on, on doing it by hand, and I think I will have uh, explicit uh, solutions by hand uh, within maybe a week or two, uh, but it's a bit more laborious than with Portabari and Makami, obviously, um, because we have more types uh, of, or, or, of pentacon equations. Uh, but I think, like I said, uh, that we'll have solutions for at least some of those. But uh, I just stuck in the simplest one uh, based on the three two non group objects um, with the trivial automorphism and the trivial uh, extra element. Uh, and then stuck it into the pentacle solver and you see we start off uh, with 656 different um, F matrices. Um, uh, and then um, Okay, then the actual F symbols that are non trivial, where you don't have ones on the outside, are there are 455 of them. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm saying after gate fixing, you have 477 F symbols left that are not gauged to a constant. And then you do the simplification, and then you have only three F symbols left, these three. Um, and uh, then you can basically parameterize all the solutions by setting these three F symbols to these particular values. So A, A1, the F symbol 767655, is sent to this number here, which is a six root of unity. Um, and it turns out that you can make 16 different choices, and all of these uh, correspond to unitary solutions. Um, uh, and uh, all of them are not gauge equivalent to each other. Uh, some of them are probably equivalent on the fusion automorphism. I haven't checked that yet. But anyway, the point is that you can actually prove that there are interesting non abelian uh, categories of this form. Uh, I expect that the full analytic solution to be some of these soon. So that leads me to the last slide. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. So, uh, well, with an Outlook wish list, um, obviously, we need to publish what we actually have. Um, and make version point one of the software software available to people. Um, and then we want to include as much as possible uh, category information uh, when we have an F symbol and R symbol into the database and tools. Um, and um, you know, generate information where we don't know it using our solver. Uh, and then you know, find natural constructions of these non-linear infusion rings, because at the moment we just fall out of the sky. Um, I hope the, the slide with the, the, the construction based on the group makes some sense, but I mean, we would like to find these things as, for example, boundaries of actual modular tensor categories. Um, and then, um, yeah, in, implement various standard constructions, particularly the Dreamfall double or center, um, and any condensation into our uh, Mathematica package, because then we can immediately build, for example, CQFTs out of any. Uh, Tensor category uh, by using the triple center construction. And then, um, then there's various other things we'd like to make uh, diagram reduction. Uh, we would like to, well, you can read for yourself. I think it's better if I open up uh, for, for questions, if there are any questions. Um, uh, the most important thing is to get the community involved in this because it's, there's far more to do than we could do on our own. Uh, and we have impractical issues, like, for example, we can't make the wiki work proof. Hopefully, uh, somehow, because you know, we'd like to be able to use pictures and have people upload files to it. And at the moment, we don't have the resources or the, the skills uh, to, to make that really happen for ourselves. So that's why it's so rudimentary. Um, so I hope that, uh, that that was interesting. And uh, thanks very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for a beautiful overview. And there's so many experts in the audience, I'm sure there'll be a great deal of discussion. Who wants to start? I'm sure. Okay, I can start with an elementary question. 
Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so, uh, in the middle of your talk, um, you discuss like uh, solutions of of the Pentagon equation, and you had some kind of almost like action on basis vectors. And now my question is the following: If you do have some solution, yeah. So somewhere here, like if you do have some really non-trivial solution on basis vectors, can you get some others by your methods? Um. So actually, the, um, the whole point of, of this uh, part of the story with the gauge is that um, you can sort of really make large families of solutions. So once you have one solution, you can easily make other solutions by essentially just changing the basis of your various uh, uh, fusion spaces. Um, or other, another way to say it is that if you, if you like categories, you choose certain morphisms that generate your category, and you can always change them by some uh, by some trivial unitary transformation or, or by some phase factor work. Um, and the point of this uh, fixing the gauge part is to actually make sure that this uh, uh, this freedom is, 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 is curtailed, that you don't actually see this anymore. Uh, you make certain choices about how the uh, F symbol should look. Certain F symbols should have certain values that you predispose, and then this freedom is taken out. And that actually enables the solution. If you don't do this, then it's much more, much harder uh, to try and solve the equations. Um, and there's no guarantee that it will actually work. But uh, the good news is that certainly for a multiplicity free theory, you can always actually do it. Now, the other, quest the other question is, can you make new solutions once you have some solutions? But there are many constructions that you could use to make more, make solutions of other theories and, um, and, and in some cases to make some to combine some solutions um, to make more. But our method basically gives you all the solutions um, of the Pentagon equations for a given set of fusion rules uh, up to uh, this gauge freedom. And then, of course, also all the ones with the gauge freedom involved because you can just apply an arbitrary gauge transformation. Um, did, that, did that help? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting because I have like families of solutions coming from completely different stories. Then maybe I just drop you email to see like if one can generate all of them because it's like very, very explicit. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that the, that the numerical uh, tools are really good for is like you find some solutions to the uh, Pentagon equations yourself from, for example, from quantum groups or something. Um, and then you want to know, well, are these all the solutions? Uh, are there any other ones that are not equivalent to these? Uh, and then uh, if the solver can actually solve the, the, the theory, the, solve the Pentagon equations for the fusion rules, you can just count. <laughs> uh, so one of the first things I did when I was building this is to check were there, were there any other solutions to the SU2 level, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 theories. Um, you know, well, I couldn't go up to 8 probably, but, um, you know, uh, that, that weren't just the ones that were generated by quantum groups, but Unfortunately, I don't think there are any extra ones. Um, yeah, but, but that's, that's why I'm asking, because I have like completely different methods, objects involved, like called buildings, but it's like, that, that's why maybe I should drop you email, because it's yeah, a completely yeah, yeah, different yeah. way to look at the subject. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I, the only real restriction is that we, we can't do very large theories. So if you have, if you have theories with 100 objects, there's no chance that this is going to really help. Um, <laughs> the computer will just die. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but in, indeed, that it's like um, my solutions, they are not computer generated. They, they are completely theoretical using like uh, computations in finite fields. So you can get a huge solution, but then maybe with your methods, one can get the others. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Are there other questions or comments? Well, uh, uh, one way to uh, classify uh, your your categories is just by number theory, uh, by the algebraic numbers you get. Now, uh, the the numbers I saw were square root of five and square root of three. Is there anything more complicated? Uh, yeah, there are more complicated numbers. Um, I, I'll wait. I'll just go to the slide with all the uh, quantum dimensions here. Um, so basically all the numbers, so these are the quantum dimensions for 20 non-abelian 
uh, fusion rings at uh, rank seven. Um, so you see all the numbers that are indicated as root uh, one plus uh, variable one minus uh, four times. So you can think of this as, as uh, a root of the equation uh, one minus x minus four x squared plus x to the third uh, is equal to zero. And yes. Then the third, and then the third root of that polynomial. Um, so that's the, that's the root of a third order polynomial. So it's definitely not this. Uh, okay. Um, that, yeah. Then uh, uh, when you look at the corresponding number field, uh, do you always get an abelian Galois group? Uh, that means uh, the, the equation up there, uh, can that be interpreted uh, as, well, uh, basically uh, uh, something which comes from uh, taking a root of unity? Or is it uh, more, more complicated than that? Uh, but, uh, to be honest, I have not looked carefully at these theories at all, but um, <laughs> because all these the, almost all of these uh, uh, tables were produced this weekend, <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, very often it is the case that the theories that can be solved, um, they have some, uh, well, I'd say, they, I'm kind of really the wrong person to ask, uh, so I think, uh, for example, Eric Raul, if he's still here, he will have a much uh, a more informed opinion on this, but there are, of course, many theories that, um, where all the numbers that appear are essentially just integers or square roots of integers or combination of those. Um, uh, but there are also numbers that have a lot more complicated number fields involved, and there is uh, work on Galois theory uh, of, of these uh, solutions. Um, but it's not something I've looked carefully into. But for example, it's, it's now, I think, known, or is it still a conjecture that if the theory uh, theory is universal for quantum computation uh, if and only if all the um, uh, uh, numbers that appear are basically combinations of integers and square roots of integers. Um, and if it's something more complicated, sorry, then it's not universal for quantum computation. And if it's, if it's more something more complicated, then it will be universal for quantum computation. Um, so, uh, Eric, do you have a comment? Yeah, so uh, that, that's still that's still an open conjecture. Although some recent progress was made, it, it is yeah. it's almost known that if the dimensions are uh, if the dimensions of the simple objects are square roots of integers, then you get a finite image of the Bray group. That's almost known. That's true for weakly group theoretical categories, and it's conjectured that all all weakly integral are weakly group theoretical. So that's uh, Green and Nick Schuch proved that uh, last year. That's the best we have at the moment. The other direction is open. It's getting close, but we're not quite there. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I have a Here question. Is. So how much, I mean, this is all very tedious and, and lengthy and so on, and I didn't understand very much. But uh, can it be used to do some, uh, you know, real stuff like, for example, uh, understand uh, conformal field theories or gate theories in two plus one dimensions and understand which of these categories appear in the context of field theories? Um, yeah, so this is a good question. Um, so I, I think I mean, the short answer is probably yes, but then uh, to give you a useful answer, is a, a bit more difficult. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, we can, I think this, this database um, and these tools will be quite useful for many reasons. But the simplest kind of application you can do is to say, well, you know, I, uh, I'm looking at some uh, physical model or some actual physical system that has anions in it. Um, and I know some, something about these anions. Uh, for example, I might know uh, the fusion rules, but, but that's just one of the possibilities. Then I want to know um, actual amplitudes for uh, processes that involve the anions. So where some of these, for example, uh, they go through an interferometer and they um, uh, they break with each other and might uh, fuse or split. Um, and uh, you can then calculate those 
explicitly from uh, the F symbols and the R symbols that come from these solvers. And actually, it's not even for well established uh, modular fancy categories, it's totally not trivial to uh, generate um, F symbols or R symbols a lot of the time. Uh, so, um, now in terms of discovering new objects, but, um, well, one of the uh, questions is that, that has been uh, fascinating people in this area, I think, a lot is uh, can we really understand, you know, all, um, I'd say, it's the uh, uh, Neumann algebras, uh, sub factors of Neumann algebras, or uh, all uh, uh, formal field theories, or how you want to think about it. But anyway, can we understand them as um, being some combination of uh, some construction from best amino rhythm theories and from finite groups um, and uh, doubles of finite groups. Uh, and so I think a lot of the interest in the Hagerup uh, theory, the six part non obedience theory, that was the first one that isn't the group, um, was generated by uh, by the idea that it might be special and not fit into the into these various uh, schemes of making theories by closed constructions or, or, or defaults. Um, and uh, I, I think there, there's some people now believe that it actually probably does fit in. Uh, but that's one reason to look for these things, so to see are there any new constructions that, uh, that we've missed so far. Um, I mean, I, I've kind of intentionally not uh, emphasized the, uh, the application to physics in this, in this talk because I knew there would be a lot of people that are probably interested in the structures form. From a sort of pure math uh, point of view, uh, but um, yeah, uh, but I, I mean, if you if you give me a conformal field theory, um, you might say, well, uh, it's not easy to find the uh, the four point functions, for example. Um, uh, but if I know something about the modular data, uh, the, then uh, I might be able to construct them uh, with some of the methods. That, uh, that we apply here, or at least it might be helpful. I expect that. Um, so, so I don't know if that helps. But. <laughs> so I wonder if there are comments from people in other direction, like Chen Khan or Xiao Gan. So I'm neither of those people, but maybe I could make a comment. Uh, uh, so you um, used yourself. Who, who are you? I, we can't see you. Sorry, I'm Eric. Eric. Oh, you're Eric. Eric, Eric Ralph. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that I think is pretty interesting about this is that so, so it looks like so when I'm looking at your table, if it has, if it's unnamed, and it has a true under, you know, uh, categorifiable to a fusion category, I mm -hmm. assume that means that you've, you've solved the, yeah, right. Yeah, the, it means that we've solved it probably a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean you know all solutions or does it mean that you have found a categorification? It means we, at the moment, it means we know all unitary solutions. Um, okay. And probably also a bunch of non-unitary solutions, but we can't be 100% sure that we have all the non-unitary solutions. Um, okay, yeah, so that's really interesting because one of the things that could, could come of this is, um, so there's a question of, um, so there, there was a conjecture a long time ago uh, that um, a modular category was determined by its S and T matrix, which is now known to be false. Um, but, yeah, so, um, but the smallest rank for which that is known is like um, 49. So uh, potentially on your list that. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, that's, it's, it's a, yeah, that, that could be one application of this list if you already know. Basically, they would have to be distinguished by their their F symbols. Yeah, so this is one of the things I was thinking about. I mean, there, one of the reasons I never published uh, the work we did before, even though like in spirit it's very similar, is because well, we just weren't, I, for my feeling, we just weren't quite able to get far enough into the set of, um, of fusion rings to really find a lot of new things. <laughs> um, and uh, even though actually we know all the stuff that most people don't know, like the, those things about the, that you just mentioned, but I don't think they're particularly 
uh, hard. Um, but but now I think we have such a large volume of uh, of rings that that it's actually very interesting for doing for checking conjectures and um, uh, and just quickly doing simple operations to figure out which rings are interesting, that sort of thing. So, Chegway, do you want to comment on how these methods are related to the TPE method? Renchang? Uh, well, using TPE method, we can solve the in a much better way. So we can find solutions quickly. And um, well, for, like for the unitary case, we can somehow find our solutions up to rank six multiplicity one. Yeah, this is similar to what, where we were getting before. Also, um, we could do most of the rank six uh, categories. Um, there were some issues with uh, cases where we couldn't find where the zeros were, but now I suspect we can do them too. Um, hello? hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a, one question. Is that the. Uh, okay. Yeah, once you get a fusion ring, uh, do you also get the S matrix which is satisfy the Valenda uh, uh, equation? Yeah, so actually for, for every fusion ring, um, at least for every abelian fusion ring, you can easily find a matrix uh, that will diagonalize the fusion rules. So yeah. that, will, um, that will, in a sense, satisfy the Valenda equation. But then you want extra requirements of that matrix. So for example, you want it to also uh, form a, uh, well, really what you want is for it to also form a representation of the modular group SL2 set together with another matrix T. Um, uh, but there are some smaller, some lesser requirements like that it should be a, um, a symmetric uh, matrix as well as being unitary and also that uh, uh, S squared should equal to the um, charge conjugation matrix. So that you can usually not find but uh, it's very easy to check if you can find it. So we did that for all of our categories and that basically is a, is a quick check to see for most categories that they're definitely not modular, uh, for most rings that they definitely don't correspond to modular tensor categories. And we I think we could, yeah, we could build a bit a better check which also takes into account the T matrix, but I didn't have time to build it this weekend yet. So, <laughs> but I think it's actually interesting um, to look at some of these theories which have an S matrix that looks just like an upper modular S matrix, but then they don't have the uh, actual graded structure, for example. So it's, it's uh, interesting that this exists. Yeah, that's very good. So let me, let me summarize, make sure I understand. So you can find a lot of fusion rings, and the, mm -hmm. each fusion ring have an S matrix, but this S matrix are unitary, but it may not be symmetric. And uh, right, yeah. the square may not be charge conjugation. So, exactly. so, so for, because of this later two property may not be satisfied. So those fusion ring may not be fusion category, or uh, mod modular tensor category. That's exactly, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I also try to uh, produce those table, but uh, my aim is a modular tensor category. I think mm -hmm. using some trick to produce fusion ring mm -hmm. and to find its S matrix, and uh, but once you find this S matrix, then I find, at least in my experience, finding T matrix is uh, is uh, much easier. So there is yeah, a way. I, 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 it shouldn't be hard. You can use the Rubin equation. Uh, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, as your starting point. I just like I said, I just didn't have time to implement it this weekend. So <laughs> otherwise, I would have probably included it in the talk. Um, yeah. yeah. So 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 most the. Uh, most difficult thing is to find a fusion ring and the, the once you find a fusion ring, the check have a, a proper S matrix is easier. And yeah. well, there, there's an interesting fusion question. ring is most difficult. But there's an interesting question there, I think, which is that, okay, so here I didn't quite get there, but it's totally um, uh, 
conceivable that there are uh, fusion rings that uh, have an S and a T matrix that look perfectly legitimate and give a representation of SL2Z. Yeah. Um, but actually, there is no corresponding even tensor category, um, let, let alone modular tensor category. So these would be sort of, I would say, ghost, uh, <laughs> uh, ghost modular, you know, um, fake modular theories. So you, you get, exactly. you get a rules and it does everything you think it should, should do, but then actually if you try to categorify it, it's, it's impossible. And I don't know of any examples at the moment, but I probably will know some, some, some examples pretty soon if they're in my, in my list. So, uh, um, yeah. yeah, those are really good point. Uh, but I, what I try to say is that if you find a fusion ring, you can quickly find the modular data. So yeah, rather than exactly, yeah. data, you don't, you don't need fusion category or not, it's a much harder question, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't need all the, all the, all the internal stuff with the S symbols. You can find the modular data from almost no effort. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. And there is another question there, which is, um, so uh, you may find a number of different T matrices for the same S matrix. Um, yeah. And it's not necessarily obvious how you should decide which one is the right one for your physical model, of course. Um, um, but but of course, if you if your model is a conformal field theory, usually it's much more obvious to find the T matrix than the S matrix because it comes from the two point function. So yeah, that's <laughs> that right. makes it uh, relatively simple. Um, yeah, depends on the context. Well, so yeah. I hate to cut off this very interesting discussion, yeah. but you. we have a time limit, yeah. and. Uh, there's another seminar that goes after us, and I don't like to overlap. So thank you again, Jos, for a really wonderful talk. And we look awesome. forward to completing this discussion <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody, for your questions. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.